Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Good evening, uh, thought leaders. Good evening, great leaders. Good evening, philosophers. I always say philosophy means the lovers, lovers of knowledge and lovers of wisdom. Um, thank you so much for tuning in tonight. As always, we are going to have a wonderful um, a wonderful time uh, tonight. We are discussing a very important uh, topic with a powerful speaker. Uh, and actually, I should have said good evening uh, in this uh, youth month that we are starting today. Uh, and in the spirit of, of youth month, uh, uh, I have asked some of our colleagues here to moderate uh, the, 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 the sessions. And tonight, <clears throat> I will straight away hand over to someone who will be moderating for us. He will take over from now and do the rest. And his name is uh, Mr. Zola Zuzani. Zola Zuzani is the Senior uh, Programs Manager at Henley Business School. And he's our member here, he's our regular here. So he knows exactly how we do things here. Zolani will take over and he will do the rest. Uh, tonight I'll be uh, listening like any other people and then we'll see you uh, when I close the session. Over to you, Zolani, thank you very much. Thank you, Prof. Thank you very much for the opportunity. Good evening, uh, leaders. My name is Zola Zuzani and I'm your moderator for tonight's program. Thank you so much for investing your time with us on this Wednesday evening. Uh, well, tonight we have an amazing speaker who will be taking us through tonight's topic entitled Leadership and Youth Empowerment. But before we dive into the presentation itself, I want to introduce the speaker. His name is Mr. Michael Tsepo. Dabane. Well, I think the arrangement of the name is not a problem. You can call him Tsepo, you can call him Michael. I don't think he minds that. That's his name, Mr. Dabane. He's an inspirational speaker who has been sharing his thought-provoking ideas in various avenues for almost a decade now. He runs his own mentorship program and he is an active, member, uh, active board member for African Leadership Academy Student Enterprise. He is also involved with Alan Gray uh, Foundation as a mentor. So we can see that we are dealing with a giant uh, 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 in this presentation tonight. He is not a stranger in various media outlets uh, where he is normally invited to share his thought provoking ideas. Mr. Dabane hails from a small village of Pankok. I believe that is Limpopo, Prof. Is, is that Limpopo or Mpumalanga? Uh, Mpumalanga, that's Mpumalanga. <laughs> that's Mpumalanga, okay, great stuff. It's good to ask because I was going to say Limpopo and someone would be like, hey, this guy doesn't know South Africa. All right. And uh, Mr. Tabana has a, a BIS degree, which is a bachelor uh, of information systems from the University of Pretoria commonly known as tax. And uh, Mr. Dabana has over 12 years uh, as, as, a, as, a, as a systems or uh, what do you call a systems engineer. Am I right, Mr. Dabana? 100% yeah, system development. That's perfect. And the beauty about <laughs> Mr. Dabana is that he likes to empower uh, his youth from his village of which it's something that most of us are still struggling to do. And I can't wait to hear what he has to say to us tonight. And uh, I believe that all the questions are going to be raised as we go along with the presentation. Thank you, Prof. Uh, we can give it over to you, sir. Mr. Dabane, you can take us to the presentation. Right, okay. Uh, thank you, thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Mr. Zuzani. I really appreciate that, uh, like that amazing introduction. First and foremost, I'd like to always make sure that I'm audible before like I give like the whole church sermon. <laughs> okay, cool. So I can see by uh, uh, Professor Majora's smile that definitely I'm, uh, I'm audible. Thank you so much for that. 
Uh, so as you heard from the introduction, my name is Michael Tsepotarani, born and bred in an amazing village called Bangkok. And I like to reiterate that simply because it's the village that made me or that created me. Like, you know, the man that I am today, I owe everything to that, like to that specific village that I grew up in. And like my village, it's, 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 it's a village that is structured in a, in a way that I believe, you know, African villages or African communities were structured like in the past, you know. And then when I was growing up, it was during the time when by, you know, the uncle next door is your uncle, the, the grandmother, like, you know, on the street is your grandmother. And then you wouldn't misbehave in front of an elder, you know, because even though you are not related by blood, but that elder, like, you know, she or he was still your elder, you will treat her or him like your parent or like your, like, you know, like a proper senior citizen, but as if it's your family, even if you were not related by blood. And that's the time when I grew up, like, and it was exactly like that. And then I still see a little bit of that in my village even today, uh, but not as much as, as it was during that time. So my village had everything, like everything, like, you know, like the, 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 the proper moral structures that molded me into, into the person that I am uh, in order for me to be integrated as a responsible citizen. I owe all of that to my community, you know, and it had everything, like I say, but it lacked one thing from my perception, at least. It lacked, you know, an immediate reference of the world that I wanted to take part in. So there were no many, um, call it role models, like around, like the village that I could look up to, that I would say, this is an exact template of the person that I want to be. I did not have that, like in my village. But however, you know, God is very merciful and and, and, and graceful. So what he like what happened is that my father used to use his car as a as a taxi. So he was a cab driver. So one day work was not good. Uh, he was a cab driver, like in like in the city of Pretoria. One day work was not that great. Then as he was about to go home because of you know there were no customers coming to his car, you know, as he was a cab driver. So then he had a knock on his window. And there was this gentleman who was, who looked like somebody who was in trouble. And the gentleman knocked on his window. He said, sir, I am actually, you know, uh, devastated. I have been marked, I've been robbed. I, like they took my phone, they took my money, they took everything from me. I don't have the means to go back to the place that I live in. And then can you kindly help me? Uh, I stay in, in a place so-and-so. So my dad, out of kindness, he helped this guy. Little did he know that this guy would then, after the trip, ask him if he has a son or a daughter who might be in grade 10, 11, or 12. Because of this guy was running a program in the University of Pretoria, you know, to help, you know, uh, kids from, from, you know, uh, from dilapidated environments, you know, to, so that they can integrate them in the cities and in the, in the universities, so on and so forth. And then he said, please, uh, and my dad was like, I have a son who's in grade 11. I was in grade 11 by that time. So the gentleman was like, please tell your son to come through next week to uh, uh, the University of Pretoria. And then there's a program we are running there. This is so much they pay, but he should not pay any cent. I will definitely compensate him for everything. I'll make sure he's integrated in the program. And then long story short, that's how, that was my journey to being in the University of Pretoria as a student there. And then as a result, then became the computer scientist that I am today. And it was mainly because of that specific incident. Why am I mentioning this story? I'm mentioning this story because there are thousands of kids out there who are like me during that time, who have a beautiful world that they want to create, but they do not have an immediate reference of that specific world, or they don't have, have people next to them who will usher them and actually open doors for them so that they can have access to opportunities like this. Since I know for a fact that there are students or there are kids who are like me during that time, but most of them, they don't have, you know, fathers who are taxi cab drivers who will meet, uh, you know, like strangers miraculously who will help them, you know, uh, like, you know, chart their, like, like their path, you know, from, a, from their career perspective. They don't have that. And then that specific incident is a miraculous incident. That is a one in a million kind of a story does not happen all the time. So then as a result, as a result that it means that I had to, because of I had a very peculiar, like, you know, like a 
specific story, then I had to then make sure that that specific story does not end with me. Then I multiply it, then I go to my community and I go to other communities that might be needing help. And then as a result, what happened now during the tenure of my university, then I had to go back home, um, you know, offering my, like my tutoring services, helping kids there to like to get by, helping them apply for university, helping them register in universities, teaching them about courses that are offered there, and also got some of my friends from the university to come to uh, like to my village and other neighboring villages to help the kids out there and then teach them and tell them about the university life, what's happening and all the things that are going on and help them go through the, the process of applications. We got a number of students, like, you know, like to various universities. We even arranged like opening days for them, Vets University, UJ, uh, uh, Tax or University of Pretoria and so on and so forth, TUT and so on and so forth. So then as a result, as doing that work, one thing happened, it is that then it opened a certain door for me, the door to, to deliberately contribute to the betterment of our youth. Because of, I picked up like a number of things as I was tutoring the students. And then as I was tutoring them, I saw like there was a lot of discouragement. There was a lot of despondence like from their side, like uh, there was a spirit of hopelessness. They were not like hopeful at all because of they thought that like the doors were closed for them. And then as a result, then because of I was a clear example that not all hope is lost. Then I was like, no, I need to be an advocate for the message that says that not like not everything is is it's is all dark and gloomy. You know, uh, like there are like like there is a brighter side to things, and there is a light in the end of the tunnel. And then I had to be an advocate for that. And then as a result, what happened now? I then had to create my own mentorship program, which is which is the program that helps and then mold and 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 help uh, like our youth to actually get by in life. And it's not only youth. And as I was helping youth, then the elders came. They're like, hey, we also need help as well. So it's not only youth that need help. Like we also need help as well. And then that's why, like my program now, it is a mix of youth and then also people who are not uh, like in, like in the bracket of youth. You know, according to our South African laws. And then, and then like, why am I mentioning this? I'm mentioning this because. This leads me to the thing that I really, really want to talk about today, which is that I believe, I believe that individual responsibility, individual responsibility, it is something that our leadership and then also like our structures, our, our institute, like our institutional systems and whatnot, they have to take into consideration, realizing the importance of individual responsibility. Understanding that in the heart of social development or social responsibility, in the heart of it, in the heart of it, like all of that is dependent on an individual being a force for good. And how do you mold an individual into being a force for good? That is not a group project. I promise you it's not a group project, it's an individual project. Because we're talking about things like their integrity, like the values that they like, like that they stand for. So giving you, giving you an example, if you have someone that you want to integrate in a society as a leader, it'd be a leader of a political party, it'd be a leader of a company, it'd be a leader of any institution or any organization of any sort. And then that person has not walked the journey of proper self-discovery, understanding who they really are, understanding the values that they stand for, and then making sure that they are people of integrity, what is going to happen? You're going to have a leader who stands for nothing. And then when you have a leader who stands for nothing, like you can only imagine what will happen to whatever it is that they are leading. And then remember that everything that we do is an extension of ourselves. If, I'm, if I have a company that runs, I don't know, like anything, like an IT-related company, for instance, like the success of that company is an extension of my growth. It's like it will grow to the extent at which I grow as the leader of that specific uh, organization. That is why when organizations grow, they, they involve more people who are more skilled in other things, so on and so forth, so that the company does not suffer at the limitations of the leader who's leading it, so that, you know, the company or the organization can benefit, you know, like, you know, like from the strengths of other people who are part of that specific organization. So at the end of the day, whatever we do, whatever that we want to be part of, if you want to be an activist of anything, of anything, without starting at an individual level, understanding who you are, understanding like what your purpose is, 
and understanding the importance of the challenges that you're facing as an individual, understanding that those challenges are the, are the very things that have to mold you into the leader that you're supposed to be. If you don't have all of those things integrated and, and then inculcated in the, like in, your, in the life that you live, chances are that you're not gonna be a leader that we are looking uh, like forward to. Today, we are talking about our leadership like in our country. We are talking about our presidents, we're talking about our ministers, the, like the entire cabinet and all of those things. Our leaders are failing us, our elders are failing us, so on and so forth. And then I promise you, it's an, like, like a leader is an extension of, uh, like, like your, your role is an extension of who you are. And if you don't pay attention to making sure that we get into this force for good, we make sure that we give you the necessary tools that give you the confidence to approach your challenges in life forthrightly, then I believe that we are like we are doomed as a like like we are doomed or we are actually in a serious like we are we are in a serious trouble like as a like as a country. That is that is that was actually the 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 the, the ethos of, of 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 the program that I started, which uh, which actually depends on six pillars that I believe are very important and I want to talk about them. Number one is the self discovery understanding exactly who you are, where you're from, and then like, you know, like the, the, the fabric that you are cut from, uh, you know, uh, specifically, like, especially, especially as, a, as a black person, like, you know, like understanding, like, like which fabric are you cut from? What kind of people, the type of people that you come from? The people that came before you, what stuff were they actually made of? Understanding that there is, a, there is this divine power that is actually, you know, like like trapped well, like like within you that was stolen from you, uh, like you know, like by the colonial powers, or like back then. And understanding that you can actually retrieve that, that you are actually a force for good, that you can actually move like your society like to a better place. And then making sure that you know, uh, once you know yourself in that sense, then you won't be drawn to things that are actually driving you from the identity that. That you actually, you know, uh, like that you actually uh, uh, like feel strong about, and it is very important, like to talk about that self-identity thing, understanding like yourself very well, understanding the values that are governing your life. Why do you do the things that you do? Uh, like when it, when it comes to ethics, like where, like in a, like where are your ethics, you know, how your values, where, like where is your, where is the element of kindness, the element of empathy, the element of your caring. Like all those things, like we need to understand them like in depth. So that's why in my mentorship program, like that's one of the main things that I talk about. And then the next thing that I like to talk about again is the whole thing of purpose. What is your purpose? What, what meaning do you draw out of life? Because of this, let's admit it, ladies and gentlemen, like there are many things that are happening in the world. There are many things that are happening in our country. There are many things that we wish were right, but they are not right the way we, like we wish they, they were. Uh, there are many things that we, we like that we wish uh, were in a certain way, but they are not. Uh, and then people are suffering, people are struggling, and then in most cases, not like you know they're not struggling because of their own doing. Some of them they find themselves predisposed into certain environments that exposes them to uh, to certain calamities or certain challenges, and that is not of their own doing. And they did not ask to be part of those specific, you know, challenges or calamities. I agree with that 100%. However, in all of these things that we see, you know, like looking at the, like the rapacious nature of our politics, for instance, you know, how, how, how tyrannical like some of the structures are, looking at those things, they can be very frustrating to our youth. And then as I engage with youth in the schools, wherever I go, uh, in my program as well, in this uh, other platforms that I'm invited to, the frustration is, is rife, ladies and gentlemen. And then they are very frustrated because of they feel like there is no one who's looking out for them. And then if our leaders, they do not make sure that they pay attention to the element of individual responsibility, teaching them that there is this thing called self-leadership. You need to lead yourself to the world that you want to create. Understanding the fact that if you want to be uh, like a part of society, there are certain things that you need to actually get right yourself. Teaching people that, you know, uh, they should be careful about trying to rearrange the world before they can get their own house in order. Those, those specific things are very important because of what kind of a person am I gonna be, you know, out there 
And then if I do not uh, make sure that I hold, like I hold firmly the things that, uh, that mold me and create me into the leader that I can possibly be, or the leader that the society can like properly benefit from. So that element of purpose is a very important thing. Uh, which, which, and then when I talk of, like when I talk about purpose, there are many, like the number of definitions for like the purpose, you know, and the general one is that purpose is nothing else but the, but the reason for doing or the reason for being why we do certain things. Why, like, why do you act in a certain way? Why do you want to do a certain thing? Why do you want to show up to the world in a certain way? So, so that is the purpose, right? However, there is, like, there's a beautiful definition that I, like, like that I love. And then I got it from this man called Andy, uh, Andy Andrews. Yes. Uh, he said it in a different way, but I like to phrase it this way. Uh, purpose is, is, is the intersection of your problems and your gift. The intersection of your problems and your gift. So where, where the challenges and then all the calamities and all the things that you're facing in the world are happening, and then the meeting point of, of those things and whatever that we are imbued with, you know, the, like the, the gift that you have that you're imbued with, where they intersect, that's where you normally find your people. So one of the sure ways of not finding your peoples is running away from the challenges that we face. And then that is very important. It's a very important information to tell our youth. Why? Because they need to understand that, you know, even though we are, we are yearning and then looking for good leadership, like, you know, good political structures, good educational systems, good healthcare services, you know, like in a, like in a global sense of things, don't we want those things? But there is still a domain for individual responsibility and self-leadership in the betterment of society as a whole. That thing is something that I don't believe, like I believe that it should never be ignored. So that whole thing of peoples. And then this now, it, it, it actually leads me to the second part of what I want to talk about is say, saying that what, what is it that I believe is the role of leadership? You know, uh, our leaders from different structures, it be leaders from from our churches, it be leaders from our from our political structures, it be our leaders from from various places. So my question is that, like now, what is the role that they can play? Is there anything that they can do? Obviously, there's so much that they can do. Obviously, there's so much that they can do. So our youth is actually yearning for like for for true leadership, for true leadership, leaders who really genuinely care about like about us who really care about our betterment, who really care about what will happen by the time when they are not around. Understanding that, you know, some of the things that they have to do are the things that will not, uh, that will create a future that they will not be part of. And then they have to be comfortable with that. And then I can see like the majority of leaders are not, like I'm not catching up with that, like, uh, like forthrightly so, in my honest opinion. And then, and then again, and this is purely from my, you know, anecdotal observation, so to say. One of the things that I've seen it is that uh, our, like the, the majority of the values that drive us as youth, especially in the South African context, most of those values are actually drawn or derived from the exams of our religious structures and our traditional structures. So which means now, you know, if we have, I don't know if, uh, like I see now, like Dr. Dr. Uh, no, is here, Reverend No is here, you know, like which means that like there's still a big job that still has to be done by the likes of Dr. No, because uh because of like, like they are in the domain, like you know, like in the religious structures, they still like they are still the 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 the, the basis or the they're still in the heart of the things that actually shape our values as uh, like as human beings, especially in a South African context. And then which means now leadership in that specific space is very important, it becomes very vital. So they need to be ma make sure that, you know, like they, they, they shape uh, like how we think and then, and then making sure that like they create environments that are conducive for us to act forthrightly in the world. So that when we take our place in the world, we take it in a manner that is actually forthright and that is actually advancing us and moving us forward. And another thing that I think is very important to note is that thing of what is positive and what is negative. Uh, so when I talk about, uh, you know, our leaders taking part in making sure that they shape uh, like a positive discourse for us, it does not necessarily mean the discourse must be peaceful. Positive does not mean peaceful. Positive, it means progressive. 
because of uh, because of there is no like what is peace if there's no progress, you know, uh, and and then like and then that's the narrative that people who try to hold on to power like they like like they try to do they try to drive the narrative that says that you know don't bend things don't do that don't do that don't do that okay that's fine we should not do that that's not the best way of doing things but how else would you want us to respond? If you are not giving us like the attention that we need, so sometimes something that is positive, uh, it might be something that that looks very destructive. But we find out that in the heart of hearts, it's not actually uh, like it's not actually negative. It's something positive because of it will create the will of progress. So then people will start to move forward because of that specific incident or that specific way of um, of sort of doing things. Mostly, so then in 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 closing, what I'd like to say is that. And then this mostly to our leaders, uh, you know, uh, like leaders, like leaders of different industries, uh, leaders from uh, like, you know, like of our academia, uh, leaders of business, you know, like the likes of uh, Mr. Andre Young, who, like, who's here. Uh, I joined the, the, like the session that was attended by uh, Mr. Bonan Mohali last week, it was. And then what they're doing there is actually one of the things that I, like that I want to see, that I would love to see uh, leaders like you know doing making sure that they, they they integrate themselves in environments that actually need their resources and it be monetary resources it be other fiscal resources and it also advice like advices uh, like advice and also you know like stuff like that those are very important things like to like to take note of so in closing what i like to say mostly to our leaders is this it is that we, we, we learn from you, from your mistakes, and we also learn from your wins. We don't only learn from your wins. So it's very important that we, we like, like our elders are genuine in how they lead us. So they are genuine in a sense that they are willing to share their failures with us. Because of, in my honest opinion, ladies and gentlemen, in my honest opinion, I don't think that um, your success as an, as an elder or as a leader can only be seen, can only be seen uh, from your wins or only calculated or marked by your wins. But I believe that your success as a leader should be seen by the number of your failures that those who come after you will not repeat. And I think that is very important to know that uh, like the legacy that I leave, it is that those who come after me, they're not gonna repeat the mistakes that I've made. And then I don't see many leaders driving that conversation to that direction because of their, like they, they wanna like come out perfect. They wanna, like we don't want a perfect leader, we want the genuine leader somebody who grows, uh, like, like somebody who is genuine about like growing us. Uh, and, then, and then again, as I said in closing, if you allow me, uh, uh, moderator, I would like to read a, like a message that was sent to me by a dear friend of mine. Uh, she sent this message to me this morning. And I believe it's very important. Uh, uh, like this is the lady who actually, I, like I give thanks to her because of Prof Majola, like the reason why I, I found, uh, like I know this platform, and then how I found out about, uh, like about, you know, about you and what we are doing here, like every Wednesday, it was because of this lady, uh, Paulina Mam uh, Mamoho. She said this to me, she said, you know, uh, Youth Month will continue to mean nothing unless we are intentional about bringing, bridging the gap. Until we understand that young people are ready and able to chart their own path, the future is theirs. And at that point, uh, like, at this, like at a point in time, uh, which which happens to be now. We have to trust them with the responsibility to make decisions about the world within which they will continue to live for generations to come. And I think that is very important, like to realize that, you know, like our elders, they need to trust us with the future of our society or the future for our country. Uh, and then my closing remarks, I'm going to close with, uh, with, uh, with, with Dr. Oliver Tambo's quote. One of, one of his famous quotes, actually is the only quote that I know of him. He says that, you know, uh, uh, like, a, in, uh, like a nation that does not care about its youth does not deserve its future. 
and then let's start to care about our youth. Thank you so much. Wow, that's a wonderful and powerful presentation. You know, you, you said something that really uh, made me to think about leadership. You talked of genuine leadership, genuine leadership. I think that's what a lot of young people need nowadays. And uh, if we see examples of leaders who are leading our countries, we will be able as well to carry on that message as we are going forward with the future of this country. Thank you very much, Mr. Tabana. I like your energy. <laughs> I like your energy and the way you have shown um, how passionate you are about this topic of leadership, something that we really need uh, for, for, for the people of this country, you know, and uh, because we need the leaders who are going to carry us to move forward. And you have shown that to us tonight. And I really appreciate your time. And uh, now we are going to our leaders in the, in the big room uh, to raise their questions to contribute their ideas, to ask you questions about what you were presenting. And uh, we are opening this opportunity for them now to, 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 to contribute to your, to, your, to your presentation. Do we have any ideas, leaders? Do we have uh, uh, comments uh, that we want to share with the whole group? Wow, Mr. Tabane aced everything and uh, we all, we are all fine. Let's share our ideas. Uh, evening, everyone. Good evening, Mr. Uh, Lucky. I, oh, I'm audible enough, I hope. Yes, you are. Uh, um, 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 good evening to everyone, uh, not just uh, Zola. Um, I, I would like to believe that uh, I'm not a leader, but a student of um, leadership, right? And uh, Mr. Tavani gave quite a mouthful and um, a good presentation in terms of um, leadership. And uh, he mentioned genuine leadership. And I would like to open it with probably a question because in as, uh, in as much as we want to think about genuine leadership, it goes back to um, the principles of leadership. Um, as a country, I'm a young, I'm, I'm a young person. Uh, I'm, I'm part of the youth and we, we encounter probably for the past 20, 25 years, we've been encountering the same kind of leadership style. And in that kind of leadership style, do we as a country, and when I mean as a country, I mean from politically, uh, from corporate uh, point of view, from religious point of view, do we have like a set of principles that should guide our country or rather should guide um, people in leadership and are taking our country forward. And I would like that maybe to be sort of unpacked um, since, since there's, there's quite a, a quite room. <laughs> <laughs> well, are, you directing, are you directing your question to, to the presenter or is for everybody? It's for everyone. It's for everyone. Just to break the ice and let's hear what everybody thinks about the principles of leadership. And they can, they can, you know, give examples from their point of view, not necessarily from, from Mr. Tavani's point of view. Okay, sure. Kim is going to, uh, he has, she has something to say. So it's going to be Kim and uh, Dr. Chuma. Uh, they're going to share their ideas. Hi, good evening, everybody. Um, you know, it's such a wonderful thing to see Michael present. I've been waiting for him to, to present on this forum. And even if it was load shedding, I'd already organized to go to an outside venue to make sure I didn't miss this. So it's such a pleasure. And 
I had hoped your presentation would be longer, but hopefully we can engage in, in critical discussion. And, you know, actually, you, you, you used my, one of my favorite quotes from Oliver Tambo, because I do think that we have a leaders now who are not fully, not this forum, but not fully appreciating the, the lessons in, in, in the youth. And sometimes when I look at the nation and I, I feel despondent because I feel the generation that I come from, I'm an old Gogo, that we failed the 1994 uh, so-called activists that we try to change the nation, we fail dismally. And I think it's for us to look to you and our youth to find solutions. So I'd like to pose the question back, instead of learning from older people, as young people, I feel we are, the country's in good hands when I see people like you, Michael. And I'd like to quote possibly from Fanon, who says, each generation out of relative obscurity must discover its mission and fulfill or betray it. So I'd like to ask you as a young person, and don't be apologetic when you see older people around, because I think you've been quite diplomatic. What are the critical lessons, you know, teach us tonight what we might have done wrong and what you feel can take us out of this terrible place of structural inequality. Thank you so much. Uh, so we're going to take the second question, or do you want us to deal with the first question first, so that you don't forget what was said? Before we go to, to Dr. Puma. I know, like, uh, we can, like, I'm writing them down, so it's fine. I will... Oh, okay, no, that's fine. Over yeah. to you, Dr. Mangisa. Uh, thanks, uh, Zola, and uh, thank, uh, thanks to you, uh, Mr. Tabane. Uh, what an insightful. Uh, presentation or lecture that we have just done. Uh, I am, you know, mostly touched uh, by one of the phrases that you mentioned that uh, as leaders, uh, we are extension. We are the extension of who we are uh, in uh, our society. Uh, uh, let me share, let me share my experience, you know, to what you are saying. Uh, that uh, I met a school principal uh, and we talked about whatever, you know, we talked about in my business as well, uh, partly uh, that of life coaching. And he shared to me that, uh, you know, uh, after the first term, you know, uh, for grade 12 learners, uh, the results were not very good, uh, you know, there was a feeling that uh, the kids are overwhelmed. Uh, the kids are wanting to give up. Uh, they see no purpose in them as kids uh, because the first term, you know, as grade 12, uh, it did not go well for them. And obviously because, you know, I run a business, I said I can help, you know, uh, motivate, talk to those kids, uh, you know, in a hall and see, you know, what difference uh, I can make to them. And he said, he will present that to, to the SGB. Unfortunately, the SGB then said, no, get somebody who will do this free of charge. Uh, we, 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 we cannot afford the cost and stuff like that. And I went back to the principal and said, principal, uh, what I want to do, it is not for the SGB. Uh, it is for the kids. It doesn't matter. Even if I were to do it for free, because we're trying to build leaders here. Yeah. We're trying to build uh, people who can take this country forward. I will do it for free. I don't have a problem with that. Uh, so uh, that phrase, you know, it touched me greatly you know, to say as leaders, we are the extension of who we are in the society. But also to add, you know, uh, when we talk leadership, uh, this is a very dynamic uh, construct. And as I've always said, you know, that uh, there are as many definitions of leaders as there are people who try and define what leadership is all about. but. As we have said, there is no leader without a purpose. Uh, a, we derive a purpose 
for ourselves. We derive a purpose for our communities. We derive visions for our country. And it does appear to me that uh, we are a rudderless country. Never mind which sector of uh, you know uh, which sector of the country where we are looking at. It does appear to me. It does seem to me that we are becoming more and more rudderless. Thank you for your insightful presentation. Thank you very much, sir. Thank you, Doctor. Thank you very much for that beautiful comment. Uh, I don't want to close anyone. Um, I, I see Sis Zanele Mashakaro has some questions, not only one question, but many questions. And I think it will be uh, good for us to give her the chance to raise those questions so that we can hear what she has to say. Over to you, um, Sis Zanele. Thank you for the platform. Um, and thank you, um, Chapo, for the presentation. Um, I think the first question for me is, um, I think there's just a stigma around someone being a manager versus someone being a leader. So how do we then merge the two to make sure that our managers understand that it does not necessarily mean that you are a good leader because you're in a managerial position. Because I think that's where a lot of challenges come um, in organizations where automatically, if you are a senior manager, you get comfortable in the position thinking that I am a good leader. And when you have people who are under you, who are better leaders, that makes you feel inferior. And then you start using your power you know, because of the position that you hold. Um, the second question um, is, um, how do we bring back the moral compass slash values to leadership in South Africa? And that obviously comes from when we look at how our political structures uh, are handling, you know, things related to money, um, issues around honesty, issues around transparency. We also looking out to our church system where the very same churches that are supposed to be building communities um, are taking advantage of um, the, the, the people that really need or have a need, you know, when it comes to their other employed and they're looking to the church to give guidance and to help them improve. So how do we do that? Um, and then the last, maybe that this is a comment to say, when we look at leadership, right? My own opinion is that somehow leadership needs to start in the home. I believe everything starts in the home. So for instance, when we look at the black culture, kids are normally told to keep quiet, you know? So the youth is not taught to express themselves the youth is not encouraged you know to have opinions so then how do you then move from a community or a family structure that is not encouraging the youth to speak within their family to then expect them to be leaders within society you know so i think we need to go back to basics where we encourage our children to have opinions, to express themselves uh, in a manner where they understand that firstly, they are heard. Because I think that's the other thing, that the youth is not heard. And if you feel that you are not heard in any way, then it becomes a problem for you to even think that you are capable of leading. Um, so yeah, so I'll pause there and then um, we can engage on that and we can take it further. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Susanele. Uh, I think you've raised quite a number of issues and I think it will be proper for us to give it uh, to the speaker to sort of answer some of the questions. I've noted some hands and uh, they, they will be asking their questions after you are done with these questions that have been raised. Mark, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you so much, uh, Mr. Zola. Yo, <laughs> yeah, those questions, uh, yeah, so those questions were, were, like, were quite amazing. Kim, I don't know why, like, like, why are you challenging me on the spot? Uh, like, yo, 
Like I need to like make you pay something for that one. I'm gonna send you like my number for an e-wallet for like for putting me on the spot. So, but anyway, uh, so long story short, so like, like uh, allow me to start with Kim's question of, of why do I think like the, like, you know, like the previous leadership went wrong? And then what is it that they can learn from us? Uh, and then in order for like, you know, to chart a better way, uh, like, or a better way forward for us. So there are a number of things that I believe that, you know, our, our previous leadership went wrong on, but however, I'm gonna sum them up and then name, and, and maybe name two, if not one, that I believe is very important. One, it is that like our former leaders, they created like a, like a system of dependency whereby our, like our youth are not, like, are not able to move an inch without them actually being involved. So what do I say, like, what do I mean by that? Like there are a number of things, like uh, I'll give you an example. It was easier to open a, a, like an insurance company or a bank, like back in the years before, like before we got our democracy. But now the rules are tighter. Like, you know, the, 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 the amount of money that you need to have, have up, up front uh, before you can open such a business, it's, 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 it's like, it's like ridiculous, like before you can do that. But in the past, like it was not like that. And you wonder why our leaders, they did not like stand up and say, hey, we want our, like our people to have like, you know, like a proper access and entry to this specific, like, you know, like services or stuff like that. So that's one of the things that they went wrong on. So, then, and, and I believe that like this system of dependency is actually crippling our, like, like our youth. Like to a point whereby I, as Michael, I don't think that me working hard is the answer to the challenges that I have. Because of even if I work hard, I'm not as connected as Zola, for instance, because of Zola's uncle or father or cousin, whatever the case might be, is more connected, he's politically powerful or politically connected. Then as a result, then he will get more, uh, like he will get more ahead than I would, even though I work twice hard as hard as he does, you know, like having, like having that, like, like that is one of the, like that's one of the things that I think our leaders, like they went, like they went so wrong on, whereby meritocracy, it is not the name of the game, but connections are the name of the game. And then like, that is a very discouraging, like premise for us as youth, because of it means that, you know, people are not motivated to be great at their craft because they go like, ah, even if I'm like, I'm excellent at what I do, but there are people who will actually block uh, doors for me simply because, simply because of I'm not connected enough, you know? And then, and then you'll see like with, like with simple things, simple things like uh, having, having a department of, uh, like I forgot that, like that municipality where the website was 200 and something million or something like that. Like I forgot the number, but it was something ridiculous, right? And then that's the work that like, I'm a software developer by, by, by trade. That's something that I could do like in two weeks. In two weeks, I can I could, I could have done that thing for like, you know, like for, for, for a fraction of that, you know? And then, and then you wonder like what is actually like happening? And then you wonder where is our leadership? And then another thing Kim, that I think our leaders like went terribly wrong on is the, like, is that thing of, of forgetting that leadership to a certain extent is sacrificial. In a sense that there are certain sacrifices that you need to make as a leader. Understanding that uh, there are certain things that I won't be able to enjoy, but my child will. You know, uh, if you take like, if you take the, like an analogy for like a biblical analogy, for instance, God tells Abraham, Abraham, he says that you're gonna be the father of nations. You're gonna be the father of nations. This man did not even have one son by that time, right? Uh, Abraham had only one son, which was Isaac. But when he meant that he was going to be the father of nations, he talked about his heritage. He was talking about the nations that will come after him. So there, were, there was a necessary work that Abraham had to do so that the, that promise that God gave him will see the light of day. But that's not what our leaders, I believe, they have done. Our leaders after, after 94, they were like, oh, okay, uh, this thing is done now. Uh, no more white, whites only, no more blacks only. Then we got our freedom. So, uh, okay, where's the money? Like, where are we gonna stay? Uh, where's my Porsche? Where's my uh, Range Rover? They don't, go like, they don't go like, you know what? We can't enjoy this now because 20 years from now, there's a child who's just been born today in 1994. 
A child who was born in 1994 is how, how many years old now? 27 or 26, right? And then like imagine where that child would be if our leaders at that time, they went to the, all the schools that are dilapidated. They went, they said, no more studying under the trees, no more studying like on, on, on like messed up desks and all of those things. We're gonna like, like redo this whole thing, make sure that we like we develop and build proper structures that are going to equip our people. What do they do years later? They're like, no, actually let's take that 40% or 50% pass rate and take it to 30%. And then they think they are helping our people. Actually the message that you are sending you are so done that we like that we cannot put the mark here. We need to take it like a, like a little bit lower. So because of the difficult thing and the, the difficult and the right thing to do is to go back to the schools, to kids who are struggling and find out why they're struggling. Find out that, you know, like their, their parents are not working. Some of them are living in child-led homes. Some of them are like they go to school, you know, like with their stomachs empty. So then as a result, and this thing of schooling is not a thing for them. Some of them, they go to, like I went to one of the schools that I went to, like some of the kids are still sitting on the desks that I sat on. And then when I, and, and then I went in primary like 10 years back. So when you see things like that, then you, then you get to wonder, what is it that these leaders are doing? What is it, like what is it that, that they are doing? Are they thinking about the coming generation? So Kim, to answer you, like it's a very tough question. So, but to answer you, you know, like uh, briefly, I would say that we need to, as leaders, uh, like of today, because I'm going to be an elder tomorrow, you know, like in a few years, I'm going to be the elder leader of that time. And then and your question is very specific, like it's very important because of you know, like, you know, uh, somebody who's five years today or 15 years old, he will, uh, he will be asking me those questions. He'll be like, Michael, what did you do? You had the chance. What did you do? What did you create for us? And then what I would love to do, what I would love to do and what I would love for people who have the resources to do is to make sure that we build from the ground, we build from the ground. And then for and then remember that there are certain things we can't enjoy now simply because of where we are, understanding the situation that we are in, that you know, be like Abraham and say that, you know, I might not live in the times when there will be a man called King David, who will be the, the king of Israel and then ruling all over the world. I won't be around when there will be a time where there's a guy by the name of King Solomon who will be famous for his wisdom. But he is my offspring. He will come from me, this person. And then as a result, then that specific ideal will still be achieved. And I don't think our leaders have that, have forth like have that uh, foresight to actually think about those who are coming after them. They think success is them being okay now, but only to find out that no, like I said, like your success as a leader is not only, it's not only seen by your wins, but it's also seen by your mistakes and failures that are not gonna be repeated by those that come after you. So I hope I answered you, Kim. Uh, so going back to like his uh, question, you know, of, of, of the thing of principles, the very important question if you think about it, because of their principles, like think about it now, for instance, we are like we are in a, like we are in a, a like in a session whereby, it, like, you know, that is led by, uh, by Worldwide Institute, you know, of leadership and development. This is a platform or this is a school, this is an academy that trains leaders. It means princi like principles of leadership are taught. They are there, they exist, but, the, but these people, they just choose not to do them for some whatever reason, because leadership guys, like you can learn it, like, you know, literally like, uh, like theoretically, but however, the true leadership is demonstrated, not, not, not told, so to say, it's demonstrated. So it's just that lucky, like people are not, actually demonstrating the true principles of leadership. If you ask them about leadership, I promise you take any, 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 any uh, incompetent leader that we have in our government today, any incompetent, the most incompetent one that you can think of and put them there and ask him about uh, the types of leadership. They will tell you, they, will, like they know them. There's a transformational leader, there's an autocratic leader. There's, they know these principles like in theory, so to say. So yes, there are those principles, they do exist. And then these people, they attend like leadership seminars, by the way, they attend leadership workshops. Trust me, like I'm talking about our ministers, our cabinets, they attend these things. You know, uh, uh, Professor Majola, like she, he speaks on a number of platforms to educate and teach leaders, but for some whatever reasons, they're not catching the spirit and I don't know why, and they're not practicing it. So it is there, it does exist. There is such a structure, but however, 
you don't follow through on the, like on that. Like I say that leadership is not only uh, like taught in the rhetoric, like it's actually practiced, it's, it, it is demonstrated. So the last uh, uh, one I want to attend is that one of Zanel. Zanel asked like a number of questions. The first one, she, she, talked, she talked about like, you know, our moral compass. Zanel, like, you know, like on the call, I, I, I remember I saw Dr. Nogo, uh, like Reverend Nogo, you know, uh, like, and I like to, and apologies, uh, Dr. Nogo for, 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 for quoting you. Uh, like the reasons that like the work that you are doing, you know, like, you know, uh, like in the, like in the uh, religious realm of things, it's very important, you know, it talks to the question that Zanel is asking about bringing back the moral compass. Because like I said, the majority of our values or our moral compass values, so to say, are drawn from the exams of our religious structures, like as things are, you know, and then, and then that's from my anecdotal observation, of course, um, but I believe that to be true because of, you know, from, my, from observation, I've seen that happening a lot. A lot of times people will be like, you know, this is not right, God does not like this and whatnot. So you can tell that, you know, our religious, uh, the, the, the religious domain is still dominant in our, like, like in how we, we orient ourselves in the map of life. So Zanele, you know, like it's, 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 it means like, you know, how do we bring that back is making sure that the likes of Dr. Noah and then other religious leaders and then other people who are responsible for, uh, you know, like our traditional structures, you know, like in our homes and whatnot, our, our, our chiefs and whatnot, they make sure that they, they create environments that involve our youth as, like, like as much as possible. And going back to that thing, like, I was, like as I was explaining, growing up, I grew up in a place whereby the auntie next door was my auntie. Uh, the grandmother that I meet on the street was my grandmother. I wouldn't misbehave next to that woman. I wouldn't. I remember like this other time I was, I was on an Uber, this other, like the, the, the gentleman who was transporting me. He said, you're not from here, right? I'm like, yes. It's like, are you from a village? I said, yes. It's like, no, I can tell by the way you are, like you, the, the way you respect me, the way you greet me and whatnot. He said, like, you know, like your mates, when they get here, they greet me by the name and then they shout at me and whatnot. I'm like, no, I'm not raised that way. I, that's not the place that I come from. So which means then there is a, there is a place for our traditional structures, you know, our, we call them Mahoshis or our chiefs to actually like that they can take part in the traditional councils. Uh, like there's a part that they can play in bringing the moral compass back. You know, our churches, they can play like a big role in that, you know, uh, like so that, you know, like they don't only collect tithes, but they also make sure that they contribute, you know, deliberately in the betterment of our people in that sense. So yeah, I hope I answered you, Zanel. And the last question we had was about manager and leader. Uh, in my honest opinion, like actually it's not in my opinion, and like a manager is somebody who manages resources, right? Uh, to maximize his resources for like, you know, uh, like for the, for the progress of whatever it is that he is entrusted with. So if I'm a manager, then, and then I have uh, Zola as my, as my subordinate, I have Gutumela as that, as that, then all it means is that I have to manage the resources, the things that I'm gonna need, is the management of resources and then the placement of time and all of those uh, other resources to make sure that whatever that you are entrusted with works. And the leader on the other side is something else. It's, 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 it's something else, you know, like, uh, and then a person who will talk better about this is the likes of Professor Major because of he, like he is the like he is the teacher of such of such a subject, you know. But from my own perspective, for me, a leader is the servant who takes the first step. A servant who takes the first step. Somebody who says, "We are here to serve, and I'm going to take the first step and show you how it's done." So yeah. So thank you so much, uh, 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 moderator Zola. Uh, much appreciated. I hope wow. I did some justice to those questions. Wow. Thank you very much for such uh, uh, insights. Uh, that, that that was great. I think now you need to take time and drink water and calm down. I, I've noted a few hands. Uh, Wait, Tumelo was the first one to, to raise his hand. And then I don't know Tagalano whether he's gone or he's just uh, somewhere in the group, but I noted him as well. But let's start with um, Wait, Tumelo, then uh, Tagalane and Mr. Andrew Young. And, Andrew Young, sorry. Okay, thank you for Zola and everyone for this opportunity. I'm not sure, am I audible? Yes, you are, sir. Yes, you are. Okay, okay. Um, yeah, thank you once again. Um, thank you, Mr. Tawane, yeah, for such a powerful presentation. Even though I started a bit late as I come from work, 
and thank you once again, Zola and everyone. So I'd just like to to add a few things, um, you know. And by the way, um, you know the questions that were just um, raised here. They've also helped me in a way. Now, you no, know, I believe that leadership also um, starts at home. You know, I had a conversation with a friend of mine the other day, and you know, I said the problem that we are having today is that we are having, you know, actually the problem is that today, but you know, from the previous generations, we are having a situation whereby, you know, like I'm 34 years old and my peers and the ones that are coming after me. We're having a problem whereby, you know, um, there's no discipline and so forth because our fathers, you know, um, they, they were preachers and they preached and they taught about morals and leadership and so forth in our churches. But the problem is that they did not begin at home. I strongly believe that it begins at home, you know. Um, Mr. Tabani knows my story. I, I come from a family where I was the last um, child and I lost all of my family members. Now, my, my, my father um, passed away when I was 11, my mother was 14, and my siblings and so forth, they all passed on. They were very young, but you know, I still thank God even today because my father taught us in a way that, you know, he, 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 everything he taught us, he demonstrated it, you understand? My father loved my mom, my mom loved my father, you know, this is how uh, we were taught from a young age. And look, um, my father, I was 11 years old when my father passed away. I was 14 when my mother passed away. I was so young. But I can promise you, today I still live by the standards of which my father used to live in, you know. And, you know, like I said, I'm 34 years old. But I'm telling you, we have a serious problem um, of leadership today. I'm telling you. Um, I'm sorry to say this, but in many instances, we have people in positions of leadership, but these people are not leaders. And we have people, and we have leaders, you know, in, 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 in lower grounds, you understand? So in 2018, I had a conversation with an elder. Now, imagine, I'm 34 years old now. In 2018, I was 18 years old. I'm a, I'm a husband, I'm a, I'm a father of three, I'm married, you know? And uh, now I'm having this conversation. I'm 28 years old by the time. I'm talking to an elder who's about 50 years old. He's a married, he's a married man as well. Now we were talking about the issue of, of, of educators, you know, who are dating learners, school children, you know. And you know, his 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 view was that, you know, like today's girls, they wear short skirts, mini skirts, and so forth. So he was saying, you know, as a result, teachers, you know, find themselves having no choice but you know, ending up doing um, the things that they are doing. But I said to him, but, you know, as a teacher, you, you are an adult and it doesn't matter. The fact of the matter is that whether that 16 year old um, girl, whether that 18 year old girl is wearing a shortcut, it doesn't matter. But at the end of the day, as an adult, you know that this is a child, you understand? So, you know, taking a 50 year old man and a 20, Eight years old, uh, 20 year old um, man and um, young man, and then and 50 year old feeling that no, there's nothing wrong with an elder, you know, um, dating, you know, a, a, a 17 year old just because a 17 year old is, is tempting an elder, you know, it's very, it's very disappointing, you know. Now, I want to say again that also, if we are, if we have today um, leaders who do not have purpose, you know, it's a problem. And this problem is unfortunate because it will continue being a problem and it will go to the next generation. It's like, you know, when we are having uh, or running a relay race, you know, that's the, the baton that you are carrying today. There's someone else, you know, further down the, uh, the, the, the lab that you are going to have to pass the baton on. So when coming to, to, to moral campus and corruption, if today we have so-called leaders we are corrupt. I'm talking about our elders who are over 60 years old and they are corrupt. You know, let's take for example, let's let, let's take for example, um, you know, in, in, in government or, or in, in politics. If today we have political leaders who are corrupt and, and these are our elders, now what are we expecting 
um, the next generation to do, you know, because the very same baton that today's leaders um, are carrying, they're going to, to pass it on to the next um, generation, you know, but I still believe that we still have leaders. We still have leaders and the future of this country lies, you know, in the hands of the young ones. You no, know, I'm saying this because in 2017, you know, I, I had a revelation. If you allow me, um, I'm going to share quickly this dream because I don't, I don't want to um, you know, take um, time. But, you know, I had a dream and then in this dream, you know, it was as if uh, I, was, I saw um, this old priest. Now the priest was, was an elderly man, you know, with white hair and so on. So he was in that sanctuary, in the temple, performing his priestly duties. But I saw something, you know, now his hair started to change from white, being white and to being black. Now, he was an old priest, but he started to change and he became a young priest, you know. Now, the, the revelation of this dream um, is that we are going to see going forward, young people taking positions of leadership. But if the young people can be, take, they can be given that opportunity, to lead, you know, like even if you look at um, our uh, at, at, um, in the like, uh, workplace, especially in the government, you know, we're having a lot of um, old people and we're having a lot of young people with qualification and, and, and you know, leaders, you know, we can, we can do, the, do the job. But it's unfortunate that at our leaders, you know, do not believe in the young ones. But I want to say again that it's, it begins right at home. So it is unfortunate also that today we are having parents, you know, who who just don't have time, you know, to to raise or to parent their children, and we are seeing uh, today's children being parented in many cases by their grandparents. Um, yeah, that's my input, and thank you for the opportunity once again. Thanks. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mr. Witumelo. Great, great. Um, information and insightful thoughts. And uh, the next person is Dakalane. Um, good evening, can you hear me? Crystal, sir. Thank you. Um, I would like to honor Professor Mazui for having invited me. I would like to thank you, Dr. Zola, and I would like to thank Michael, who just presented. Um, I would like to indicate that, or oh, let me ask, uh, Professor Mazu and those who are running this platform. At what level does this collective that is here are hold accountable in terms of having a scorecard? Scorecard meaning things that are said in this forum and somebody is doing monitoring of what people are saying and doing. I'm saying this because I work for the great city of Johannesburg. I'm doing monitoring and evaluation. At the beginning of the year, each and every five year, the election in the country, mayors are elected. I do not know how many of us who are sitting here attend our IDP consultations. In Johannesburg, we are sitting with 77.7 .7 billion rent up for grab. Last week, we were attending an energy in Daba. There's IPP coming up. One of a young person from BBC, Black Business Council, stood up and said, the president said, there is nothing that the country so far can show forth as far as IPPs are concerned, as far as Black people are concerned. Before coming to a meeting, I just read a very warm heart statement that in the Eastern Cape, there is a BP, a, a, a facility that has been open, managed by two black African women. And the gentlemen who facilitated that we used to work with. Now, I'm talking to leaders. We talk from the level of where we are sitting and the level of the exposure. This is what I'm exposed. And therefore, we can whinge and moan about what other leaders are doing. But there are those in their small corners are cracking it. In Soweto, there is an institution, or rather there is a Saturday school. That Saturday school is run by a gentleman who's from exile, a mathematician. 
an electrician. He, he speaks Russia. He can do wonders. He has brought young people. There were 38 of them when we addressed them. We were there to encourage them, to motivate them. My heart was at ease when I drove in the township of Soweto where I saw young people were drinking alcohol, but there were those 38 who every Saturdays, they spend their time to teach genetics. That's what I can talk about where I come from. The Bible says the prophet has got no honor. Would I then stop? To reach out to the young people, I will never stop. My contribution to the session, remember we lead from where we come from. We cannot blame our forefathers. We can quote what Oliver Tambo has said. The reality is this, what are you doing where you are? I'm challenging all of you. How many of you knows about e-tenders and how many of you are you participating? Allow me to say, Thank you for the time you gave me. Well, thank you. Thank you so much, sir. Thank you so much. Uh, before we go to uh, Mr. Dabane, let's just give uh, Mr. Andre Young the opportunity uh, to raise this question or make a comment. Mr. Young, sir. Sure. I, I, I sit here listening and I, 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 I think we've forgotten some basics. Let me, let, 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 let me share what I know are the basics that my mother taught me to what the previous speaker just said. You know, leadership is about leading the ship of your life, my life. I mean, I lead myself. I was taught this simple rule, and I put it in the, in the, in the comments as well, because I want what I've said verbally to be felt in the vibration of the text. There are four engines that we use to run this life. Number one, it's my soul. Number two, it's my mind. Number three, it's my habits and my body. Now my soul, let me explain. I'm an African. Né? I was raised in KwaZulu. And we were taught this thing called Ubuntu. And let me, let me, let me break it down for you simply. Ubu to become to your highest being or potential. I must lead that shit. That engine of my life, I must lead it. I must become my highest being in this life. My mind is the engine number two. My thoughts, my feelings. Do I take care of my thoughts and my feelings? Do I nurture my feelings? Number three, the engine number three is my habits. What are the things that I do repeatedly that inform my character? And number four, my body. What do I say with my mouth? What do I do with these hands? these eyes, these ears, these nose, this body, my bodily parts. Do I use my GPS, God-positioned soul in this body? Do I use it? Do I lead the ship of my life? Am I in control of these four engines? My soul, my mind, my body. Before we look at anybody for leadership, lead yourself. Take care of your engines. Do I check myself, correct myself? Am I being awakened to the responsibilities that I have in this role I play? Am I awakened to the responsibilities of the roles I play? I mean, am I building relationships with other like-minded leaders who are leading their ships, managing their four engines, who are checking themselves and correcting themselves of this GPS, God position soul. Am I using the resources made available to me? The previous speaker just said it. This country has got all the resources. Open your eyes. 
this bodily part of yours. See, open your ears, listen. Do I abide by the rules which are the governance set up in this country to make us work? Let me tell you, when I was a youngster, I mean, I'm born in the 60s. When I was a youngster, my leaders were there on the border fighting, being killed by the apartheid government. They went around to hold my hand. They were, they were ducking bullets. There was no example other than stay alive. The leadership example I have is sitting on campus, them shooting me. The leadership example I have is that of violence against me. But you know what my leaders taught me? Stay alive, pray, connect to God, run the four engines of your life. Stop looking to the leaders, man. We are trying to stay alive. <laughs> You know, Mazwi, this 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 forum of yours, ne? It 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 it's got me. It's it's got me. It's got me enthused. It's got me excited because you are sharing the wisdom. Let me tell you, ne? The only way we could get to be alive is to not be killed. That was the example. Duck the bullet, stay alive. But then we were also taught the responsibility, the character required to lead ourselves, nobody else but ourselves, and to help Abantu, because we were told Ubuntu, become your highest being, not, 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 not you show me, I do. I do it, I become my highest being. I, the soul, position myself under God. I, my GPS, I find my way. God directs me. He directs my mind, directs my habits. He directs my body. And let me tell you, hey, if we are gonna end poverty in this country, it starts with one man at a time leading himself or herself. Please let me not be gender uh, uh, incorrect. It starts with one person leading themselves and then two, and then that one and that two connecting with the other and saying, okay, you are doing it, I'm doing it, let's do it together. But stop telling me about people who are not doing it right. Don't waste your attention on those people. Get yourself right. Lead your ship. Get your engines moving. And I kid you not, if we're gonna end poverty and if we're listening to what, my brother and colleague Bonang said the other day, poverty is black. Poverty is black in this country. But if we want to change it, we must invite diversity to the party. Meaning I must invite myself to the party of abundance. I must invite myself to the leadership using my four engines. I, and I love what Bonang said, if you want to be prosperous in this country, Build your own business and employ your own children. That's what we had to do in the political struggle. We had to say to each other, hey, we are gonna fight this thing together. We were employed by our leaders who were killed by the way, to build the country, to build the solidarity required to bring about transformation and change. And we did it politically, but the economic struggle continues. It's your job, Michael, to lead the ship with your four engines. Your job, your job, Zola, my job, Mazri's job, Kim's job, Melusi's job. We must lead the engine of our lives. Stop looking for the ANC. They are not going to give it to you. That's the wrong people to put your attention on, especially the wrong people in the ANC. They are not leading their lives. They are creating disaster. But there are some leaders in the ANC, let me hasten to add, that are leading the ship of their life and the four engines properly. Mwah. But let's be clear, if we're gonna change anything, it's gonna start with us. We have to dance at this party and lead the ship of our lives. I leave it there. Wow, thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Andre. Wow, such a dynamic speaker. <laughs> thank you very much. Uh, Mr. Tabana, is there anything that you would like to say before I can give a chance to others? 
No, from my side, uh, if you think about it, like the, the, the previous speakers, they didn't raise questions. It was more uh, like, you know, comments and remarks. So then I, uh, like all I have to do is just to appreciate, you know, like the contribution that they made. Uh, thank you so much, Mr. Andrew Yang. You know, like every time when I listen to Mr. Andrew Yang, I know that I'll pick, I'll pick something up. And then, uh, and then if you think about it, like it's like what he's saying is, is, is actually in the center of, of, of my presentation in the sense that I'm promoting individual responsibility and self-leadership. That's the ethos of my message tonight to say that, you know, there is a domain for self-leadership and individual responsibility at the heart of the things that we want to change on a societal level. And then if we ignore that part that you no, know, like that, that, like you know, like uh, like the way Mr. Andre is putting it, you know, like the four engines. If we ignore that, I can promise you, you can only imagine what kind of a leader you're gonna be, or you know, like or what kind of a person you're gonna be when when we set you like, or when we send you out there to the world to make the change that you want to, to make. You know, the famous um, Mahatma Gandhi's thing. What what did he say? He said that be the change that you want to see, and then that's exactly like in the ethos of the message that I was giving him. And then thank you so much, uh, Date Yang, for actually like putting it out there and make and cementing that uh, like to the to the audience. Thank you so much, uh, uh, Mr. Zola. Uh, so you can go ahead. Oh, thank you, thank you very much. Elsas Pumzile has some beautiful words. I think it would be proper and and uh, uh, important for me to give her the platform as well to say what she has in the heart. Um, I, I know that she has written something very interesting there but i know that there's there's a message be, be, uh, behind uh, those words that she has written says pumzile uh, mia would you like to say something uh thank you very much can you hear me yes ma'am okay thank you so much uh zola and mr um, professor Mazwe as well as Tsepo. Tsepo, thank you so much for sharing your story with us um, I think that is what a leader does. They share their, their being with others so that they can also, it's like they multiply themselves. So you've shared what you, what you went through, you've shared your story, and it makes your story, like sharing what you went through makes, it, makes your leadership journey authentic. And when you help your community and uh, it's like you're giving out or rather giving back to your community. It makes uh, the, your leadership journey even nicer. So thank you so much for sharing. And I think as young people, I'm also, I can say I'm also a young person, also in the still learning, still learning. Um, I'm also helping teenagers. Uh, I have a few that went to university. Uh, so far, I only have one graduate, but one is something than having nothing at all. So I think um, it is very important that in as much as the world, we can blame the world, we can blame ANC, we can blame whosoever, but let us work in making a difference in our space. So when we do that in that way, we are applying that self-leadership. When we do that, we are making our environment positive. And when you share your story or when you share your life with uh, young people, and when you start seeing the fruits, it makes everything beautiful. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Siswam. Thank you very much uh, for that comment. You know, most people are, uh, lose jobs nowadays because they challenge leaders and leaders don't like to be challenged. You know, and uh, I see the similar, you know, thought from Ongumusa uh, Mandlokov. Uh, would you like to raise a question, sir? Ongumusa? Okay, I can read his question. And he says, how to be a leader who can, who can handle criticism in the workplace whereby you apply uh, the rules or principles and ethics of the company. And in the end, superiors put a blame on you and tell you, you must apply the rules as it is because the generation is different. So how does a leader 
handle criticism. Because people are so used to old ideas, so you don't challenge me. How do leaders uh, uh, handle criticism? That is the question that I'm getting from uh, Mr. Bongumosa. I think you can note that question down before I can go to Simpiwe um, Gadi. Or do you want to answer it right now, Mr. Mr. Dabane? No, like I was, yeah, yeah, like I was just gonna give my view. And then I don't think it was gonna be too long. It was gonna be a very short view. So, you know, uh, and giving it like a disclaimer that, you know, in my leadership, I mean, there's even like a, like a lengthy one. So then I'll give like, you know, like the, the you know, from the, you know, like from the perception of, of, of the leadership that I managed to have in the small time that I've been a, a, an upcoming leader. I'm still an upcoming leader. So what I can tell you, it is that, you know, if, if you are a leader who can take, who can take criticism, I don't think you know why you are there. That's number one. Uh, because of as a leader, it's not about you. I think remembering that it's not about you is very important. That it is about, like, it is about the, the organization. It's about whatever it is that you are called to lead. And then if anything, if you will prioritize anything that will actually, or, or I'll say like obstruct the progress of that which you are called to lead, then it means you must question yourself as a leader. So then, uh, so first and foremost things, uh, like it's very important like to know that it's not about you, it's about what you are called to lead. And then training yourself uh, like, you know, to understand that it's, it is about the entity that you're called to lead, like is one of the most important things. And I think it's also important to also liaise like, with the likes of uh, Professor Majola, you know, because of they are like they are teachers, like, like in the leadership space, you know, uh, talk to people who are training and teaching leaders on how to gain the necessary confidence to take criticism, understanding that criticism is feedback, it's feedback on the things that you need to change, things that you need to work on. It's not a bad thing. It's just a thing that says, we don't like this specific thing. It's not making us progress, or it does not take us forward in any way. Please fix it. And then if you are indeed a good leader, and somebody who deserves to be there, you will definitely heed like advices like, like, like an advice like that one. And then make sure that you liaise with people who have been trained leaders, because uh, of this very important guys, like people who don't make uh, acquisition of knowledge one of their priority, one of their priorities in their lives. I don't think those people are serious about life in any way. So you need to make sure that you layers with people who are equipped enough to train people who are in your position. That is like, I find that very helpful. Oh, great stuff. Thank you very much. Uh, criticism is a feedback. I love that. Criticism is a feedback. I should remember that. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, we're about to close, but there's one more question that I would like um, to, to, to raise, which comes from Mohab. What it does person or does personality affect how people lead? Does personality affect how people lead? I'm asking this as someone who is soft-spoken and have been told that I have to toughen up in order to lead. You must be very strong when you lead. So does that mean that um, personality affect how people, the way people lead? That's a very powerful question. Because I mean, we were created differently. Some of us are soft-spoken, like uh, Mohabu. Some of us are, are, are have loud voices. I mean, but th there's nothing wrong with that. But her question, I think it needs a little bit of attention. Uh, can can we help her, please, before we close? Uh, like, if you allow me, can I ask Professor Majul or any of the leaders to take that one? Prof, it's been, it's been given to you. Wow, thanks, thanks, uh, uh, Mr. Dabanes. As you know, that it's a day tonight. We are always learning here. Um, you know our motto here that we, we come here to learn, to unlearn and to relearn and every Wednesday is exactly what is happening. Even tonight, you don't know how much we have learned already. So yeah, I always, the, Obvious, there is that talk uh, from certain people when they describe leadership, that leadership must be strong, must be tough, uh, bold, uh, decisive. Yes, all those things are important. 
but it's just the wording. And I always say, instead of probably using tough leadership, I'll use effective uh, weight because once you use that weight of a tough, then uh, it's like you are, you, you, you are actually saying uh, it must be militant, you know, and people must be bully. Uh, so it's very important to the wording uh, that we use. Uh, as I'm saying that, uh, uh, I always hear that uh, people, but as I'm saying, when I teach, when I, when I coach people, I would say, yes, we need decisive leadership. You need to be strong. Um, you need to be effective. You need to be, um, you, you need to take charge. You need to know yourself. But yes, uh, in terms of uh, toughness and other strong words, they are very misleading at times. In terms of personality, leadership, it's about confidence. Whether you're, so, you're soft-spoken or you, you are louder, it doesn't matter. As long as in your soft-spokenness, you can exhibit that confidence. Because if you are not confident, uh, people will, 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 will laugh at you and then will walk over you. So I mean, personality in leadership, yes, it does. It, it does. Um, um, it does play a part. Uh, but as I'm saying, that it really doesn't. Uh, there are people who are very good leaders. Uh, others are introvert. Uh, others are extrovert. So it doesn't matter. The important thing, remember, is just the impact. That effectiveness uh, that is important. Maybe because you have. Uh, 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 moderate on your kindness that you've given me the, the time. Um, I just wanted to address this thing about criticism. And I really uh, like what uh, uh, Mike has said. And, and that's very good. That criticism is a feedback. It's very important. But there is something in leadership. And I've got a cause uh, on this. I give it to uh, universities, even to companies, the cost of leadership or the price of leadership. So many of us, whenever we are assuming leadership positions, it's about excitement, it's about glitter, it's about karma, it's about yes. And I always say how many of people, uh, when they're offered leadership position, they would say, I no, 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 not boss, no, 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 boss, boss, it's not for me. We are always jumping to it, but we, 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 we forget that there is cost in leadership. And criticism is one of those costs uh, when you are a leader, you must know that you'll always be criticized. Uh, obviously, we are not saying you must do things that will attract criticism, but because you're a human being, because you lead, because you make and take decisions, not everyone will like and love your decisions. They will criticize you, they will insult you, they, they will gossip about you. So those is what we call cost that it's a package, it comes, with, it comes with this thing that is called leadership. As much as there is something that we call the perils of leadership or the dangers of leadership uh, in terms of um, uh, the things like corruption. So in other words, the perils are those things that you must guard against. When you assume leadership, what is it? The things that you must, the ego, egoism or egoism. Uh, popularity, you know, those things are being surrounded by uh, wrong people. Those are dangers uh, of leadership. But as I'm saying, it's just a package uh, and it's very, very important that we remember as leaders, we'll always um, uh, uh, endure uh, uh, such things. Thanks very much, uh, Babu Taban, and thanks, uh, 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 Zuzan. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Prof. I, I know that we are taking the last uh, questions. I promise that we will only take two, only two people before we we, we give over to, to, to Prof. Majola to, to wrap up the whole program. And I have this Paulina and you know, Dr. Mangisa. So I give them only the opportunity to, to, to raise their questions or comments before I hand over to Professor Majola. Thank you so much, Budzola, and good evening, colleagues. Thank you so much, Mike, for the incredible presentation. I really enjoyed it. I thought it would be good to ask last, taking into account the different contributions that people have made to this conversation. And mine, um, Mr. Zuzani, is just to make a contribution to the conversation and also answering the question that the colleague asked about personality in leadership. 
What I want to highlight is you always lead from the truest version of yourself. So when it comes to leadership, it's not about being tough or presenting some form of, 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 of a character that is not you. You lead from the truest version of yourself. If you are able to navigate and to be uh, confident in who you really are, you can actually lead in the most quiet and subtle voice. I say this because that's one my leadership approach. I, I hardly am loud. I hardly want to lord myself over people. That's something I don't do at, at all. But leadership is felt and seen by what you do. And as a result, people follow your actions versus what you just say. So when it comes to leadership, do not critique your personality and discount yourself from leading just because your personality to an extent is not what we see in popular media because leadership is something that emanates and anchors on the truest version of yourself. And secondly, just to also hinge on the point that Prof Manjola had highlighted around criticism. I struggled a lot with it, especially being a perfectionist, um, which is something that I learned to do. It was more genetic than it's just something that I learned. Criticism is on what you do, not on you as an individual. So whenever you receive criticism as a, uh, as a leader, try and assess at which point is it coming from and what is it trying to address. Usually criticism addresses the action or particular participation in society versus you as an individual. So even as you're a leader, whatever that you do, that's what's criticized because if you were to switch and take a 360 turn, the same people that criticize you can praise you. But also note this, if you rise by people's praises, you can similarly go down by the criticism as well. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Sissy. And then over to Dr. Mangisa. Mangisa. Uh, thank you very much, Budzola. Uh, 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 I am partly covered, you know, by uh, Professor Majola because the question was posed: uh, How do we how do we deal uh, with criticism? And uh, you know, my take has always been. Uh, the moment we say it is criticism, uh, we find ourselves in a defensive mode already. Uh, you know, we, we, we forget, you know, to, to, to understand that there is positive criticism and negative criticism. Those that I speak to, therefore, I say, uh, when we hear the word criticism, uh, as Professor Machola has articulated, let's take it as feedback. Uh, that is feedback, which in the main, it is supposed to build us. However, we need to qualify then this criticism. Uh, practically, in the corporate, you find leaders or bosses who in all material time, they believe that it is their way. The other way, it cannot go. And therefore, whatever you try and innovate and come up with, he will find a way to shoot you down. You find a way to criticize you so that uh, whatever that you are thinking of, it must be seen as not making sense. It must be seen as it is never gonna work only to find that the same boss, he will tweak it and take it to the board and deliver that which was hard on you, criticizing you. If it is done genuinely, if it is done genuinely, if I am criticized therefore, from an emotional intelligence point of view, I will try and put myself in the shoes of the person who is giving me feedback. Open up my mind, be open enough, and begin to understand where he or she is coming from. If it's positive feedback, it will indeed build me. But if I were to see it as negative feedback, obviously, those are some of the things that I would not consider. And that environment, more often than not, it will become a poisonous and toxic environment. And therefore, that innovator 
does not belong in that institution. That innovator must therefore leave. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you ever so much, everyone, for, for your questions, for your comments, and for giving me the opportunity to steer tonight's uh, program. And uh, my special thank goes to Mr. Dabane for sharing his wonderful presentation. I mean, I can see the comments here. They are full of praises. You have touched many people's hearts and they really love what you had to say. We appreciate it. May the Lord give you strength uh, so that you can touch other people's lives as well elsewhere. Uh, over to you, Prof, and thank you to you too. Th thank you, uh, uh, Zola. Thank you so much for moderating tonight. We've learned a lot. But before I close the session, ladies and gentlemen, for me, it's just to close. Um, I think just to give uh, Michael uh, time to give, you know, just to do your closing remarks or your parting shots. And then after that, I'll close the session. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much, Professor Majola. Thank you so much, uh, Moderator Zola Susani. I really appreciate it my brother, for those kind words that you gave, and then for also directing this program like that, like, like it was a masterpiece, you know, being a, a Toastmaster student, like that was like something else, like well done on that, like I, like I really appreciate like the justice that you gave to this. And thank you again, uh, Professor Manjola, again, <laughs> because, you know, like judging by the esteem and the caliber of people who presented in this platform before, uh, like I can only be honored and, 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 and feel privileged, you know, to have been given the opportunity to share what I was sharing today. Thank you so much for that. Uh, that's, that's, yeah, so the thanks are out of the way. So my party shots, all I like to say it is that, you know, as upcoming leaders, I think it's very important to note that when people judge us or criticize us, they judge us, they don't judge us, criticize us on the, from the perspective of our intentions. Because they don't know our intentions, our intentions are known by us. So normally, the problem now is that when we respond to their criticism, we respond from the perspective of our intentions, and we forget that they don't know. Because of they only judge us from the perspective of our actions and behavior. So it's very important to know that because you'll do certain things and you'll be like, "But no, I didn't mean to do it that way, and whatnot. Why are you judging me like this, like that?" But only to find out that those people are only judging you from what they see. That's what you are showing them. And then that's, that's the only thing that they have. That's the only thing that they can talk about, the thing that you do. So it's very important, like as our leaders, that, you know, talking back to the question that Lucky asked, to say that other principles, yeah, they are there. I've, I, like people know these things. You might know certain things in theory, but please, let's act forthrightly, like, you know, like the way uh, Mr. Andre Young said. Uh, of all the things that are happening in the world, of all the things that are happening in the world, we can respond in two ways. One is to respond in a, in a nihilistic way whereby we take everything negative to a point whereby we don't see the beautiful things that are happening around us. Like the way Mr. Takalani was saying, you know, uh, Mr. Takalani Mbara, the way you were saying, there are a number of things that are happening that are good in our, like in our society. But for some whatever reasons, our youth, the majority of our youth is facing to the things that are not giving them, uh, like that are not, Giving, pro giving them progress in their lives. And then there's, it means there is something that we, the leaders that we see these things that we need to do. There's a work that we need to do to make sure that we, we work with this, uh, with this thing that's between our ears, to make sure we work with the brains of our youth so that they face to the direction of the things that are progressive, you know? We're living in the world whereby infamy is becoming more important than, than vocation. You know, people are, don't focus on vocation, they focus on being famous, you know, and then and then that's a problem. And then it means there's a lot of work that we need to do so that some of the programs that you know uh, uh, the likes of Mr. Takalani are doing, you know, in the government space, so that most of our youth can flock to that direction, uh, and then and then and so that then you know like we, we can see the progress that we see. So, but thank you so much. I really appreciate this. This was quite awesome. Thank you so much, Professor Mandela, for the invite. Uh, as you know, I'm. I'm a regular here and I'm going to continue being a regular. Uh, much appreciated. Blessings. Thank you, sir. Thanks, 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 uh, Michael. Thank you very much. Uh, indeed, just like uh, Kim, uh, uh, it has been long, uh, really, I wanted Michael to, to, to come and empower us here because I, I, know, I know him, uh, what he is capable of 
And as we've just witnessed what has happened tonight, we've been so empowered. And thank you so much, Michael. Uh, obviously, as you know here, we, we, re, we rotate. We are all speakers. Tomorrow is someone else. Next time will be someone else. Next time will be someone Everyone is a leader here. This is a community of leaders. We meet here to empower each other, to sharpen one another, to strengthen each other, to correct each other, to encourage each other. So thank you so much to those uh, who, who joined us for the very first time. If it was your first time tonight, thank you so much for attending. Uh, and would like to share the invite as well. Please do uh, join us uh, even next week because we meet every, every Wednesday at 6 p.m. So what you have seen tonight can you imagine getting it every every Wednesday? That's what makes us come back here every Wednesday. Uh, and please do join us again next week for another powerful session with another powerful uh, speakers because that's what uh, we do best here. Uh, we've got powerful participants and powerful uh, speakers. So please do join us next week, Wednesday, but also uh, do join us. We've got a Facebook, um, uh, what is it called? Facebook page, yes. Um, it's called Leadership Think Tank. If you can go to Facebook, you can just search that Leadership Think Tank and then you can just join that uh, page. And that is where all of us also converge there. We are members of that page and uh, you will meet all sorts of leaders there from politics, from uh, business, uh, religion, everywhere. I mean, who, who participate in that. Uh, and we are more than welcome to, to post any leadership related material. I always emphasize that because um, if you're gonna put any flyer that talks about what, what, what we'll remove it immediately. We are very disciplined. We want something that has to do with leadership. It's a leadership uh, material. We are not. We would love you to empower us. So thank you so much. Unfortunately, Zola, there is no register uh, tonight, and hopefully next week we'll be more organized than tonight. But please, would like to share the recording uh, uh, with anyone who'd like to receive it. So uh, you may just. Uh, what write to our office it's uh, can you write there zola in the chat room it's admin at worldwideleadership.co.za uh, so those one who would like to receive a recording uh, write to admin at worldwide leadership one word uh, worldwide leadership.co i mean dot za and we gladly uh, that's right admin at worldwide Leadership, excellent, thanks Zola, thank you very much. So please take that and then you can engage with us even if for any other um, ideas and any other thoughts as well, use that, uh, um, um, what you call uh, email. Thank you so much ladies and gentlemen, the session is adjourned now and we'll meet again uh, next week Wednesday as I've said. May God bless you um and um yeah goodbye this session is, is closed now <laughs> thank you very much thank you Thanks goodbye. Everybody. Goodbye. Bye. bye bye thank you good night <laughs>